So I'd like to discuss uh, the gradient flow of what I am calling uh, for today the gradient flow of microstructure because we are here in Pisa where we're at the Scuola Normale, in fact, uh, essentially, where the gradient flow plays a very important role. And uh, this is... Um, this is, uh, this is the sort of microstructure I have in mind. This is a picture of, uh, of um, nickel. And um, <clears throat> we'll talk about that genre of, of, um, of, um, of uh, microstructure. Just let me, it will take me a little bit to warm up here to get going, so just hang on. And uh, so, um, it is um, an enormous uh, honor and uh, privilege to have been, uh, to be invited to uh, participate in this, uh, in this, in this uh, event, uh, in this event uh, to uh, honor the memory and, and uh, celebrate the legacy of uh, Ennio de Giorgi. And uh, what I would like to say is that uh, I carried from the Scuola Normale and also from uh, my experience of with, uh, with Louis and, uh, and uh, Brazis, who's not here, the, the idea that uh, when working on an issue, whether it's a big issue or a small issue, um, it's important that young people work, work with me. And uh, so I have always uh, stressed that, and we stress that in the uh, Center for Nonlinear Analysis, which uh, Irene uh, is, uh, is uh, where Irene is the super boss at uh, Carnegie Mellon. And uh, we do in, in all of our projects, as you saw in her talk too, there were many uh, postdocs and students involved, and there are here as well. And that's why I put all their names here, so I can advertise that to you. But they're not all students. So uh, Shlomo Tazan is uh, my colleague, in, uh, he's a computational scientist, and Katie Barmack, who used to be my colleague. See, they, I have current addresses here, but these people were all at uh, Carnegie Mellon uh, during uh, various parts of this work. Uh, so she is our colleague in, in uh, material science, and Eva Egling, who is at uh, Fraunhofer, is not exactly a postdoc. She was a visitor, and very important for uh, establishing the, the uh, numerical procedures. And then uh, Maria Mayanenko, now at George Mason, Katharina Epstein, now at Utah, uh, Richard Sharp is in industry, uh, Patrick Bardsley was a student of um, Katja Epstein, and uh, he, uh, because of his work um, on our project, he now has a uh, postdoc in Texas. Uh, Xinyang Lu, you must know very well. He is from here, and, uh, and uh, he is now at McGill. And then uh, I will also m mention uh, work with two uh, young French French postdoc, post former postdoc, Léonard Mont Saint Jean, already mentioned uh, by uh, Giuseppe Savare and Laurent Dietrich, uh, who is at um, who, who is with us now. And uh, this work is um, to, to occurred over many many years, and we um, uh, we had much contact and indeed earlier discoveries with our colleagues in. Um, in material science, Gregory War and uh, Tony Rollett, uh, Russell, Sch uh, Russell Schwab and Shane Shu are also uh, postdocs, former postdocs at, at uh, the Center for Nonlinear Analysis, who, um, who were interested in this work. And um, so um, I am very happy to be able to continue this tradition, uh, or to, let me say, to start a new uh, seed, uh, a new site for this, uh, of course, now over many years, this tradition of uh, attempting to bring young people into uh, valid science. And uh, that is part of the objective of the project, and uh, indeed, most of the funding is for that. 
And uh, okay, so now we uh, pass to the part where you're going to have to listen to me. He says, do you talk? Yes, but I don't uh, understand what I'm saying. <laughs> so. For the seriousness of this uh, event, I removed many of my cartoons. So, <laughs> so first, uh, I'd like to talk a little bit about microstructure. And, and now, you all know, you know what microstructure is. You, you, you've experienced it. My, my objective in, um, in this discussion is to um, more or less try to present uh, a combination of the point of view of my colleagues with whom we worked on this and uh, of the sort of confounding, uh, uh, I won't even call it chaos, but the confounding disorganization uh, and confusing, uh, uh, confusing evidence and so on of the subject altogether. So, uh, the, the feature of microstructure, which I wish to discuss, is texture. Texture is an arrangement, refers to the arrangement of grains, say, by orientation and geometry, or maybe not, but something like that. And what, whatever it is, it's a major issue for materials performance. And uh, uh, the challenge is the management and control of, uh, of texture during coarsening. So this is just plain language. And uh, it's and ancient, yes. Uh, there's evidence of, uh, of, of um, materials processing by uh, hominids 70,000 years ago in South Africa. So this is, and coarsening itself, which was the same thing which was done by those uh, those uh, ancestors of ours, or maybe side branch of ours, um, is a process where, say, average cell size may be increasing uh, in a microstructure, typically by heating. Heating is, you can do it other ways too, but uh, heating is typical. And here are some examples. Um, so the lifetime properties and large structural elements, of course, um, you can understand. And on the other hand, um, so the, 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 the cells and the large structural elements, which would be the, just the steel and the wings, or the aluminum skin, and so on, they might be hundreds of microns. And here is the nanometer scale aluminum thin film, uh, which was, is uh, uh, used in, um, well, now they use copper. Now it's copper technology, but it's uh, used in interconnects in computers. And so, for example, a, an issue which arises there is the resistivity of the thin film uh, and the so-called Mayada-Shotsky theory of whether uh, the elect, basically whether the electron mean free path is, is governed by specular reflection or whether it's stopped by grain boundaries. One or the other has an influence on the way the material is going to be processed, whichever it is. It's not important to us what the answer is here. Okay, so how is the microstructure presented to us? Uh, this is called the orientation imaging <coughs> microscope. It's a capture, uh, it's capture and texture characterization, uh, and it's mesoscale. So we, we are always looking now at a scan of the surface and then of, of the material in order to characterize it, and it's presented to us like this. So um, <coughs> on the left is some, uh, some pictures from aluminum. They're not quite the same. And on the right, some pictures are from magnesia. Magnesia is not used for anything, but it's easy to make. It's good in the laboratory. Here are some pictures of aluminum and magnesia. Here's another one of nickel. These are called pole figures, and they illustrate grain boundary uh, population. What we have to think about this is that it's not uniform. So grain boundaries do not occur over the spectrum uh, the entire spectrum of possible grain boundaries on the one hand, and on the other hand, it, it's, it's, uh, this, this number is positive, and so the region is full. Uh, there, there are always some boundaries with a given orientation. Not all boundaries uh, minimize energy. And 
The other uh, feature of this um, picture is that this is, in fact, what the way it's presented to us. And you can see that it's not quantitative. It's simply not quantitative. Not only is it not quantitative, but if you can imagine to yourself how you would characterize an, a, a, a grain boundary, not the grain, but the grain boundary, you would characterize it by uh, perhaps the normal direction of the grain. Let's just look here at one of these, the normal direction and the lattice misorientation. Namely, there are, these, are, these are elements of a cubic lattice and so to go from one to the other via rotation. And then, so altogether, there'd be five variables. Here you're looking at two. Okay, and one of them, one of them is chosen in advance, but the others are averaged out. So what do you think you could do with that kind of information? And uh, the answer is, well, maybe you can process the material to some extent. And that's it. So this is, this is what, we were faced, what we were faced with. And it's still the most common way uh, to, um, to uh, ca characterize a material. Only there are now some clear differences in the way that this information is perceived. I want to tell you now about two discoveries we made. Before that, I want to mention that it's clear that any order in this system must be conferred by the boundary network itself. I'm going to come back to that uh, in, uh, in a couple, in a, in a few minutes. So uh, <clears throat> here we, uh, we, 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 we were able to make a simulation. So this is the empirical distribution or the histogram of relative grain boundary misorientations from a simulation with this energy, which is essentially x squared. Um, it has to be periodic, of course. <coughs> and uh, here is uh, the green curve, which you can barely make out. I tried not to use much green later on. Um, is a plot uh, fitting it to a smooth curve. And that smooth curve turns out to be a Boltzmann distribution for the uh, energy with which we simulated. So that's, that is uh, one uh, fact. And together with that fact, <coughs> I want to add uh, a second. Um, so here, so this is the title, but I'll read that later. So here, we, made a simu we simulated uh, an energy uh, which was um, not, not quadratic, but just quartic, a sort of shallow well, and obtained a bimodal distribution. Here, on the other hand, you see the result of an experiment different from the uh, pictures which I showed you before, those pole figures. <coughs> a particular lucky special experiment where the energy was measured and the population were measured, these independently. And you can see that, so for this shallow well energy, there's a bimodal distribution. So in comparison of experiment and simulation, shallow well energy, bimodal GPC, uh, and uh, GBCD. So we call this the grain boundary character distribution. We didn't make up the name. Uh, it's the relative amount of grain boundary per misorientation and normal. And so here you see consistency uh, that offers dramatic uh, confirmation of several things. Among others is that this curve on the left, the ones we produced, were, um, <clears throat> were, done, were executed with a reasonably large scale, well, not very large scale simulation of a curvature, curvature driven growth. And so here is a statistic uh, derived from a theory, and this statistic, uh, this is just a statistic. There's nothing, there's nothing which tells you that this is anything more than um, counting the number of people named uh, Luigi in this room. Okay, it's just a statistic. And, uh, but the consistency offers really dramatic confirmation of, of curvature driven growth. And now we do not uh, uh, generally obtain, and we don't generally, we wouldn't generally find 
a, a, a Boltzmann distribution. But you, you can see is that these are close enough together that we can have a lot of confidence. And the second discovery is that if we choose here some sort of artificial situation where, <clears throat> where the uh, interfacial energy, the prescribed interfacial energy, I keep looking up there, I'm getting dizzy, where the prescribed interfacial energy uh, depends only on the lattice misorientation and not on the geometric character, on the normal or anything, then the GBCD is always a Boltzmann distribution. And this is the simplest possible distribution you can imagine, which is no distribution whatever, right? It's the simplest one. So this is, I say, compelling evidence that this GBCD, which is a product of curvature-driven growth or is measured in the material, is actually a material property. It's that it's a valid statistic and a consequence of the theory of coarsening. So, as it says there in red, I probably should have made that come in later. Microstructures are naturally ordered. The microstructure which you're partially sitting on, uh, the microstructure which consists of the rocks in the street or the materials you're you work with from day to day, there is a natural order to them. We don't necessarily know what it is because they don't have that kind of energy, but there is a natural order to them. And this is something new. You will excuse me, I hope. I'm taking advantage of the fact that we have a very long break coming up and that uh, no one is speaking after me for quite some time to simply, <laughs> I hope, but you just wave your hands if you think I'm going too slowly and I'll beat up. <clears throat> so it's very easy to think of possible things which are statistics, like we just said the number of people in the room with a given name or something like that, but which you have no reason to believe are statistics. One, one example also is grain orientations. So grain orientations, not the grain boundary orientations, but the grain orientations are frequently collected and resolved as statistics. But as you will see, because we are able to make a good theory for the grain boundary character distribution, there can be no theory for the grain orientations, per se. There have to be processing, extra processing, to deliver the grain orientations, because it's the boundaries which are making the configuration. Likewise, it is traditional to count um, grain areas or grain radii equivalent uh, disks or spheres of grain radii. But there is no com good theory for this statistic. And uh, given the amount of anisotropy, which is a typical material, not very much. There could be, but it's never been found. OK, so my job today, I see, is to explain the origin of the Boltzmann distribution could it possibly be a gradient flow which we find in nature? And uh, in this context, I also want to point out the, the work of Lau and uh, Otto, which, which Felix will discuss tomorrow, which is a different gradient flow for uh, basically for the Omgren Taylor Wang uh, coarsening uh, process, which is. Um, so there they have the process, they have it. Here we had to discover it. Here is a picture of grains of beta brass from Mullins. Uh, the diameter of grains about two centimeters. So the idea here is to, is to tell you that, um, that not only the structures can be big, but even cells can be quite large or quite small. There's no natural scale, no gen general natural scale. Okay, now 
uh, let's take a look back as to how we began thinking about these things and how uh, my colleagues began thinking about these things and how they were presented to us you know, a long time ago. And this began with uh, Cyril Stanley Smith, um, who was the uh, advisor of Bill Mullins, who was my colleague. In 1951, for example, this paper came up. And he is asking uh, people to, uh, ma there's a big meeting, and he's asking them to, uh, to apply mathematics to this. So this is a soap froth, and uh, they discover that the average number of facets per cell is six, uh, which you will recognize if you, as, as you doze off this afternoon as a constraint on the Euler characteristic um, of uh, simplicial decomposition of the plane when, when once only triple junctions are permitted. Then, then the average is six. Um, someone wrote a paper about this and um, just for amusement tried to imagine where that paper was published. Okay. So Smith said, uh, well, really coarsening itself, the process is governed by two global features. The first is cell growth according to a local evolution law, and that's in competition with a space filling constraint. Okay, and these will both play an important role for us. A space filling constraint means that cells can't just grow, that somehow smaller cells will eventually disappear. And uh, okay, so here's. The, and the mathematical view means uh, that it makes sense to look at simulation and to, in order to drive, derive uh, such a theory because uh, in nature we have too many defects, basically. The materials are too dirty. Okay, here's the answer. It was published by uh, W.G. Graustein in Annals of Mathematics in 1932. So, can you believe that? Uh, a botanist friend asked him why. And, and then, I, th I don't know that it was, uh, a Smith then found it. I don't know how Smith found it. He's a, um, these guys were very smart. Okay, so here is our um, reprise of what an evolving network means. Uh, Curvature-driven growth began perhaps with Burkhardt and Reed. Um, this particular version uh, is due essentially to Mullins. It's uh, just what you think. There's a normal vector and a tangent vector. And there's a lattice and a lattice misorientation. Uh, the curve moves um, by its normal velocity according to curvature and a grain boundary energy density. And the normal velocity is some kinetic constant times C theta theta plus C times kappa on the curve. And there's a force balance. So this is called Mullins equation. And there's a force balance at triple junctions, which is just the natural, it's called the Herring condition, but it's just the natural boundary condition uh, in equilibrium for this equation. And was actually one of the first things we pointed out to our colleagues is that that was just the natural, their condition, force balance, was just the natural boundary condition. And that meant, of course, that the problem should be well posed, right? Um, well, they weren't thinking of that necessarily, but we certainly were. Okay. And uh, the space filling constraint means that uh, there can be facet interchange, as you see here, or some grains disappear. And so uh, first uh, re mathematical result about this, which we know, which I know was uh, done by Leah Bronsart and Fernando Reitish in the early 90s at uh, Carnegie Mellon. They were both uh, post, well, postdoc, postdoc-like appointments there. And um, I did some work with uh, another postdoc at the time, Chun Yu, and um, uh, to discuss large networks. And uh, there's subsequently some other work. There is work in different contexts, of course. Uh, there's a lot of work in different contexts, phase field and so on. These all have advantages in some sense, but they also have uh, some difficulties. Okay, uh, there's a very recent uh, work um, which I'll tell you, first I'll tell you the von Neumann, so-called von Neumann Mullins N minus six rule, which is that in the case when the energy density is constant like in a soap film, then the rate of change of area dA dt is some number uh, which you just calculate um, like 
2 pi over 3 or something, times n minus 6, where the n is the number of facets. And you do this just by integrating. Uh, you write the ADT, and you just integrate it around the boundary and take account of the jump, and that's it. And there's a new result uh, from 2007 of McPherson, um, uh, Professor Bombieri's colleague, and uh, Srolovitz, um, which, which uh, proves this for high dimension and is extremely uh, deep uh, using a uh, Hodwiger measure. And, uh, um, but it, and it's very, very interesting. Um, solves an issue which had been dangling for 50 years. Okay, so here, in fact, you can see uh, grain trajectory, individual grain trajectories from uh, and uh, from a uh, simulation, you can see that they are piecewise constant, and there are only finitely many slopes, validating more or less the uh, uh, von Neumann Mullins rule. Now, uh, there's dissipation in this system, and that's very important. So, the um, energy is written there. It's just the sum of the energies over the curves. And this is about the only calculation we're doing this afternoon. Uh, the rate of change of energy is minus the sum of the integral of uh, the Vn squared plus V dot, uh, these sums over tr triple junctions of this, uh, whatever that is, those, those forces, but by the Herring condition, that vanishes. And so uh, the system is dissipative. And that's a local dissipation equation. We're not considering critical events or rearrangement events when things, uh, cells are deleted. But it looks like when you integrate it, an ensemble of inertia-free springs. And uh, that sug is suggestive to us of something, and that uh, the dissipation. And uh, uh, our objective is to upscale this dissipation to a relation for the grain boundary character distribution, and success here perhaps can lead to an explanation of this Boltzmann distribution. Okay, so there is uh, there are a number of situations where you can do this, where you know yourself how to. Uh, I'll just hide these sunglasses. Uh, uh, how to how to do this this kind of upscaling? For example, here is a situation which you may remember from your childhood. The Ehrenfestern. So the Ehrenfestern, which is, do you know about the Ehrenfestern? Do you remember? So it was, uh, I think first it was first presented around 1907 by um, um, Paul and Tatiana Ehrenfest. You consider um, a number of balls, and balls, uh, say, distributed in two urns. A ball is chosen at random, not, a, not an urn, but a ball. A ball is chosen at random and moved from one urn to the other. And this is a, an early model of, of, um, of, um, of osmosis. And the state of the system is, uh, is the population in one of the urns, say this urn A or whatever. And it's more likely that a ball, ball is chosen from the more populated urn so that the uh, urns or the population in the urns serve more or less as sort of a restoring force to try to equalize the, uh, the population. And uh, so the theory is then that the distribution uh, of uh, urn A, as you do this many times, the distribution of urn A is uh, governed by uh, the Ornstein-Uhlenbeck equation, because a linear restoring force, uh, as uh, the number of uh, balls becomes infinite. And uh, so is this a gradient flow? Does the classical urn process follow some kind of weak topology kinetics? And so we can compare this with Markov chain realization. Here I wrote it down for you. I copied it right out of Feller's book. It's just right there. It's in every book. It's in every probability book which deals with Markov chains. It's the first example which is not random walk. OK. And uh, here is the first part of the answer. So here is the. Um, here is the uh, stationary distribution for this particular implementation, a very small urn, a uh, very small urn population, just 
128, two to the seventh balls. That was okay. But we did it many times. Uh, I did it. I did it. So as you know, it has to be pretty easy, right? Because what I know about simulating, you can um, put in that class. And uh, the, uh, the, the, uh, the stationary distribution is a binomial distribution, which you can also figure out pretty much in your head. And uh, it, with, uh, it corresponds to a diffusion constant, which is one over, uh, basically one over 2n, uh, if you let like x squared b look like the, um, the potential. And you can, did I write down where it came from? I didn't. But you can, you, this is a consequence of just a de Moivre Laplace one. And uh, now let's look at the uh, relative entropy of the, um, uh, with, res with respect to these uh, stationary distribution here, uh, made in such a way so that the integral of the probability distribution is one over the um, unit interval here. And uh, this is the kullback leibler relative entropy. And uh, the black is the relative entropy of my simulation. The red is the relative entropy of my tracking Markov chain solutions. And as you see, they're not right. Um, so we'll have to try to come back to that. And this raises an important issue for us with respect to um, our understanding our grain boundary character distribution. So now, uh, just as there was stochasticity in the urn, of course, we would pick something. There's, of course, a great deal of stochasticity in this, um, in this uh, grain growth uh, process, in this coarsening process. So here is the average area of five-sided grains in uh, an aluminum thin film experiment and here in a simulation. Here in all simulations, simulation of all facet sides, at a given time, you go up and you see the average area with respect to that. If you, you pick one of these lines and you, follow, and you follow it up and you see the average area for that facet class. However, uh, what we know already from the von neumann mullins law is that uh, the coarsening does not follow uh, is that, is that five sides should be decreasing. So, uh, so what, of course, is happening is that at this time, uh, you are looking at cells whose, uh, which had uh, six sides uh, or seven sides or eight sides a few moments before, you see. So these um, rearrangement events of losing facets and so on are clearly very important. They play, they play a big role in the evolution of the network. And uh, this leads us to consider a simplified coarsening model which has rearrangement but no curvature. And it's another system we seek to establish as a gradient flow. But I'm going to go very lightly over this because I don't want to uh, over, I don't want to, you know, <clears throat> I want to emphasize just the issues that we faced, not the technical details of how we uh, over, overcame them. So I show you what this uh, coarsening model the simplified coarsening model is. We had used it for other purposes with uh, Barmak, uh, Melianenko, um, and uh, Dmitry Golovati, who is a former uh, student, actually, of Mete Sonar and uh, Tazan. And you just take an interval, and uh, you uh, prescribe an energy and put parameters on each of the subintervals separated by these red dots. And you write down an energy which is C of alpha i times the length of the interval. And you just make here a uh, gradient flow. dx i dt is minus dE dx i. That's this difference. Then dE dt is minus some dx i dt squared. So this is our, like, our local evolution gradient flow. And uh, when the length of a segment is, um, uh, you know, disappears, you take it out. And uh, here is also the uh, velocity of the ith interval. Looks like a second difference quotient, but the indices refer to contiguity, contigu to contiguity of the intervals and have nothing to do with uh, relations between the actual numbers, the alpha i's. OK. And so here we have an energy. Uh, here we have a dissipation relation. And now we're going to upscale this one, and I'll show you how we did it. Uh, in terms of its character function. And uh, so here we have the energy. I wrote it down here in terms of rho, this character function. And now I want to take this 
a velocity term and want it to look like uh, or dominate this expression, which is v squared rho d alpha dt, integrate over small interval, and b should be bigger than or equal to, and here you know already because I came back here to the mothership to talk to you about it, that this is going to be uh, the Wasserstein metric, okay? And uh, this is a competitor uh, to the Wasserstein metric, assuming, of course, that it satisfies some uh, compatibility relationship, which we can assume too. So we do some analysis uh, here, and in 2D, this is quite subtle, but this was done by Xin Yang Lu. Uh, and um, we must add an entropic contribution. So the entropic contribution is due to the fact that the ensemble has changed. We change the ensemble, you have to account for that. That's the origin of entropy, right? So here is, uh, an, uh, an, uh, here is a new uh, F instead of, um, instead of E, which has some simple entropy. This is the simplest entropy I could think of, or, or we could think of. And uh, this was, by the way, this development of this theory in the subsequent uh, simulations, not the primary ones, but the subsequent ones, which you see, were done uh, mostly with uh, Katja Epstein, and, uh, and she deserves a lot of credit for this, I think. So here is a free energy, and uh, here, is a, um, here is an expression, uh, a dissipation equation. Um, for uh, the energy at a given time tau uh, versus the energy at some initial time zero or some beginning to measure time is zero. And the challenge now is to identify the GBCD statistic by associating it to a gradient flow and we have to discover the context for this. Okay. Okay, so this time I'm going to let you off with a math lecture. You know, it's more likely to happen here or in France than it is to happen in the U.S., but anyway, there we go. Okay, okay, so, uh, so again, here is my uh, dissipation relation. This is entree to the gradient flow. So here we have a Kantorovich, Rubinstein, Wasserstein metric, or Wasserstein metric, in its, uh, in its description by, um, by Benamou Abrenier, also, of course, in papers by Otto. And, uh, that metric, of course, is a known measure of statistical closeness, and there are books written about it. Um, and um, so we're going to look for a gradient flow for the Wasserstein metric like this and set up an implicit scheme. And so we've heard about this of course, a, number, uh, a number of talks already. Um, and uh, in particular, refer to the a book of Ambrosio, Julian and Savare, and, um, and subsequent books. There's a new book by, uh, called uh, Mass Transport for Applied Mathematicians um, by Filippo D'Ambrosio, uh, Saint Ambrosio, interesting book. Yeah. So uh, we set up here an implicit scheme for this metric. Um, and uh, so, and, and by analogy with the um, with the CFL paper that was mentioned in, uh, in Umberto Mosco's talk. And, uh, and so here it is. Um, you set uh, rho star equal to rho k minus one and determine rho k equal rho in the variational problem. Here, some kinetic constant mu over two tau d of rho rho star squared plus f sigma of rho is minimized. And then you line these up um, you know, for, for time. And then the claim is that as the time step tends to zero, the uh, solution, uh, the limit solution is a solution to the fokker planck equation. Uh, and then, uh, and so this is a result of Jordan uh, and Otto and myself. And, uh, and so in particular, uh, as uh, time tends to infinity, the distribution tends to a Boltzmann distribution, indeed exponentially fast. So this explains, this would explain the Boltzmann distribution. If we can do this, we can explain the Boltzmann distribution. And it also, by the way, and just in, in abstract, uh, 
establishes in general the connection between entropy and diffusion. So when, when, when thinking about a thermal system, this explains, the, establishes a connection between entropy and diffusion, which until this time was formal. <clears throat> okay, so success means that the GBCD, which is an empirical first order texture statistic, resembles the solution of a Fokker Planck equation. So I say again, you know, a statistic doesn't have to satisfy anything. It can just be a statistic. It can be, an, you, you know, the, the, it can be like the buses which are passing the uh, bus stop. It can be like the grain orientations, for example, or the grain, or the, or the histogram of grain sizes or something like that. There are many possible statistics in systems like this. But not all of these have, have theories. And then without a theory for the statistic, it's just a number. That's a lesson for big data, yes. So we're going to uh, first identify, uh, see, when we wrote down that energy, <clears throat> we, um, we did not uh, uh, set the temperature parameter but must decide if one exists. So we don't have a theory for the temperature parameter. What we saw uh, was that for our model, um, our little um, um, urn, uh, Ehrenfest urn, we had a perfectly good theory for that temperature parameter. It was given by the Dumois Laplace law. And depended on the population of balls. And although we suspect that the the temperature parameter we're about to find also depends on the population. It depends in a sort of much weaker fashion. So uh, we, we set out the kullback leibler um, relative entropy, which is uh, also by now just called relative entropy. And, um, and this tends to zero uh, for the proper choice of temperature parameter, but doesn't otherwise. So let's take a look. So here is 2D coarsening. So this is a summary of 2D coarsening. And, um, and for uh, the simple energy, which looks like x squared, 1 plus epsilon sine squared 2 alpha, epsilon is a half. There's a picture of the energy, uh, period of the energy here. Uh, we have everything set out. Uh, here, I have just a plot of the integral of rho log rho. And is, this is increasing. And now that's good because that means uh, it should be decreasing in entropy. I mean, it's the math entropy. So when in physics they say entropy is always increasing, here you think entropy is always decreasing. And right, entropy is always decreasing. It means in the end everything is uniform. In fact, here it's increasing, so it's not going to be uniform. So this is good. This is indication of development of order in the system. And here uh, we have it. So this is a collection of possible relative entropies. The red one is the one we choose. We choose this by picking a final time when about 80% of cells have uh, disappeared uh, and have been evacuated. And uh, the, the simulation slows down to about nothing. And um, it takes a couple days to run one of these. And we then determine it. Um, by uh, convex duality. Um, uh, we determine that number. It's also a, a maximum. It's the same as a maximum likelihood principle. Did you know that maximum likelihood principles were really just convex duality? That's all they are. And, uh, and so we determined it that way. We didn't do it by I. And, uh, and now we obtain, <clears throat> this is the, the blue, is the, um, is the limit statistic uh, averaged over, I think, 20 trials, 20 trials. And the red is the Boltzmann for the sigma, which we determined on the previous page and uh, previous slide. And you can see it's a really good fit, very tight. So this is very convincing. But um, does entropy uh, characterize uh, the gradient flow? That's the question. So we were satisfied with this. In fact, we published it like this. But, um, 
be, and that was the best we could do at the time. But as you can surmise, uh, entropy by itself does not characterize a gradient flow. So here's gradient flow revisited. Um, so, uh, so I offer you two examples. So now you can relax. I'm just going to tell you something you're very familiar with. So if you can say the heat of equation in any convex function, then um, the rate of change of the integral, the phi of u, is uh, negative. So any phi is an entropy for, any convex phi is an entropy for the heat equation, right? Likewise, <clears throat> If P is a probability matrix with some stationary distribution, P stationary, then the relative entropy, P, P, uh, with respect to the stationary distribution, decreases as you go down the chain. Phi of P is less than or equal to phi of P, P stationary. Where phi here is just the kubak leibler relative entropy, which I introduced before, only I called it F because I didn't want to write the dependence on the stationary distribution. So I uh, need a metric uh, or dissipation uh, for this. And here I refer again to Ambrosio Judy Savare. Uh, and for a conventional gradient flow, this is exactly the two lines which are attributed to, to George Heap, right? Uh, and uh, so uh, you can write uh, this expression if this C is the gradient flow, that phi at uh, C of at t minus phi of c at t plus tau, and then minus um, these two guys squared, which in their product is what would appear if you were just integrating, uh, is always less than or equal to zero. But it's only equal to zero if the two of them are the same, or let's say parallel with some kinetic constant that you put into the system, and, or you think is in the system. And, uh, and so this is what characterizes the gradient flow, that equality, which we learned, of course, by reading uh, Ambrosio and Julie and Savare, and then uh, Ambrosio and Julie, and so on. <clears throat> so that's due to De Georgie. So let's go back and see how that works for uh, the Ehrenfest Ehren, okay? Well, Actually, I probably finish on time. So uh, you have to sample. Uh, you have to regard the. Um, we have to regard the um, the um, the histogram that we collect. This relative. This in this case, it's around. We're looking at its relative entropy. But you're looking at a bunch of distributions collected over time. You have to regard those as samples. Uh, they're collected at certain times. They happen to be machine times but they're not necessarily going to be uh, or have any relationship with the actual times for the actual process, right? Just like uh, any other such thing. As you know, if you've ever done such a simulation, in fact, you can't, you don't do it by, um, you don't do it by picking a ball at every time from, from the, from the, um, um, from the collection of balls or changing an element from zero to one at every time. This will never work. You have to, in fact, put in a Poisson, you put in some Poisson distribution or something, try to randomize it somehow. And uh, okay, so, and that's how we got this picture in the first place. I did it myself, it's pretty easy. But, <clears throat> but now the tracking Markov chain is not matched. And, um, so we can fix that. Now the tracking markup chain matches. So what I did, of course, was I calibrated it. I calibrated it differently. I um, <clears throat> what I did. To cal I don't know what I did to calibrate it was, of course, uh, incredibly simple. But it took me six months to figure it out. But it was incredibly simple. It's be I realized that when you when you take the finite, this Markov chain, and you let the number of balls tend to infinity, you get a half the Laplacian, right? You get a half the Laplacian, because we have, you all know that, right? 
And when you look at any uh, stochastic analysis book, what they call a Laplacian is what we call, what, what they call a Laplacian and what we would call a half a Laplacian. And that means every time step, to make a time step, you have to go two space steps. So, in, in uh, approximately, you know. And so, uh, so instead of collecting the statistic every cycle, you collect the statistic every other cycle. And I got the right picture, you see. So this calibrates it, and now everything works. So now let's take a look at the, um, at the uh, dissipation relation. Let's see if you get something with dissipation relation. This is it. Let's see. Dissipation relation. Here it is. You see? It's flat zero here. It's zero here. Uh, did I? Uh, I'm trying to think. Here it is. OK. So here, of course, you, you don't see. So, um, okay, so we've had variational inequalities already this morning um, um, from uh, Figali. And, uh, and, uh, and so this function f is convex. So we, this expression will always be less than or equal to zero, but in practice equal to zero without any time parameter here. And because everything works. Now I wrote it here in a way which is not correct because yeah, I didn't write the plus a half this squared plus a half that squared, uh, because I didn't want to confuse everything. But, you could, but that's, what it, that's what's here. The right thing is here. And what you can see is that long before you reach equilibrium, you're in the gradient flow regime. There you are. Right, certainly from about 0 0.6, um, 0 0.6 up here, where they two come together, in fact. In fact, if you start the Markov chain over here, it, it just stays on it. So. So this is a success. This is success for something which should be absolutely successful, which you should be able to do in your head. But it says that even this um, Markov chain, which every child knows, uh, maybe you've forgotten it, but you knew it, um, is in fact uh, a weak uh, topology gradient flow. And uh, this is a, something which is in a, uh, moves with this dissipation is in fact equivalent to um, um, a, Fisher, a Fisher information, and therefore corresponds to a gradient flow. This difference, pk minus 1 minus pk, is the formal difference quotient of a, um, it is, uh, in fact, satisfies a continuity equation. That's what it means to uh, be the Markov chain. But you don't know it satisfies a Markov chain. You have to calculate that. I did. OK, I checked. It does. OK. So now let's go back uh, to sampling and calibration for, uh, and rescaling for the uh, gradient flow. And we also do it for the one-dimensional problem. So uh, here it's essential to establish a time scale and regard the simulation steps as frames or samples of an evolving process. <clears throat> we have two here. This one, which is our green growth simulation. I'm not showing you any movies today. Um, and this one, uh, why waste your time? And this one, which was the 1D um, model problem, a lower dimensional model problem, which I'm not going to show you the information for. And so you have to establish a sequence of time intervals of the frames by comparison with a computed solution of the PDE. And then, in fact, we'll check to see whether the solution tracks the PDE. So this is an inverse problem because the machine time is not the same as the Fokker Planck time. OK. Um, so I am showing you a movie. OK, here's the movie. This red one will uh, gradually expand. So there's a simulation. OK, enough of the movie. So here it is. So here, uh, this red curve is just the difference in relative entropies at a, at a given time minus the previous time. That's always non-negative. And it moves down, yes. And this uh, is the dissipation relation with the Fisher energy, which you can see is that's a magenta. And it's flat. It's almost flat zero. It, it starts a little bit positive time. And it's almost flat zero. And here are the density plots of the solution um, at 20%, 40%, 60%, 80% of cells deleted. The simulation was stopped at this time when about 80% uh, were deleted. 
And uh, they're compared with the um, red curves. They're in blue, and the red curves are solutions to the Fokker Planck equation at those times. And you can see how uh, miraculously this 2D coarsening system, whose movie you saw in the previous slide, tracks a solution of the Fokker Planck equation. This is astonishing, I think. I mean, I can say that it's not exactly my work, you know, it's the work of a whole group of people, um, but I think this is very, very interesting and different. And here's the relative entropy picture, which I just re repeat for you. However, um, as always, um, something happens, okay? So here's a quartic potential. And here is the same picture for the quartic potential. Now, the um, blue curve are the evolution of the statistic. But when you calculate the Fokker-Planck equation, so first of all, our method for determining the, um, the um, um, diffusion coefficient works perfectly. The relative entropy works perfectly for diff determining the diffusion coefficient. But uh, the simulation of the Fokker-Planck equation starts with these uh, transients, which then die out. Uh, but you can eliminate those transients if you, um, if you choose a time-dependent diffusion coefficient, which then, uh, whose limit is the right one at the right time. Then everything works. But somehow, this is not quite satisfactory. So we have something to do here. You know, I don't think this is quite the right thing to do. But in other words, we, have, we do have some challenges. We have some challenges. And, um, and again, um, some more gradient flows in the wild. Um, <clears throat> well, you know, I had a long. Um, not, not extensively long, but I, I was new to Georgie from, from the time I came to Pisa, of course, until he died. And we spent um, the years I was living in Pisa, we often, uh, we ate lunch together almost every day because that's how we eat lunch, right? And uh, we had dinner together frequently. So we had many, many good times together. Uh, I don't have any uh, relatable uh, experiences, that is to say, ones which are not embarrassing to one of the three or four participants, except that, of course, the Georgie was just a prince. You know, he was always very sweet to everyone, very rarely uh, became disturbed, and he had a, this marvelous fantasy. Yes, he could walk down the street and start talking about something. Uh, like it was up in the sky, and just relate what would happen if this, what would happen if that. Can you imagine, you know? It was very, very charming. So here, anyway, here is the second, uh, the second Markov chain you will find in a book like, um, like Feller, for example. In the, in the US, we use Feller as a, we used to use Feller. Now there are too many probabilists around, so. Also, Feller doesn't have um, all the modern uh, probability in a martingale. So, no, my, Feller doesn't have martingales in it. So, I mean, at the undergraduate level. So, uh, they use other books. But the next one is the Wright Fisher gen genetic drift model. So, the Wright Fisher genetic drift, um, uh, I just recall to you Fisher, Wright, and Haldane. So, I don't know how, how much you're interested in this. Um, I didn't pay much attention to myself, but then I was assigned to teach something called um, undergraduate research experience. And so I'm not trying to, I don't want to insult anybody here in the room, but if you want to teach an undergraduate research experience, you have to choose a subject where the mathematics is accessible to the undergraduate on the one hand, and on the other hand, they don't know it, right? So there's a unique such a subject uh, in our curriculum as mathematical biology, right? So you can get to research level in mathematical biology with only knowing some ODEs or something like this. So that's what we do. And so uh, I have a book about, uh, a number of books about this, and one of them is Gus Fisher-Wright Haldane. 
still, and in the book it said, is still considered by many biologists to be the best, the most useful application of, uh, or, or, or use of mathematics in biology. And you know what it was, yes? The fisher wright haldane theory is what connects Mendelian genetics to, uh, to, to genetics, to biology, and uh, uh, to evolution, let me say, to evolution. And so this is, of course, extremely uh, important. And there's a, subsequently a huge amount of work. And in fact, you can buy a textbook on evolution and how to, con uh, how to construct phylogenetic trees and how to do this. And so it's a, this is, uh, ex a, for our culture and for our mathematical culture, I, I urge uh, all my students to learn this because it's, it's worthwhile knowing why evolution, what the background for evolution is, and it's right there. Okay, so here is a, so this is what we're working on with um, Dietrich uh, and Monsignor. And here is just a single locus, two allele, uh, n diploid individuals, m equals 2n, is the size of the gene pool. And this is a Markov chain with this matrix, which is, roughly is that there are a whole bunch of uh, concatenated um, uh, uh, Bernoulli trials, whereas the Ehrenfresterin was just Bernoulli trials. And uh, it leads to this uh, Kolmogorov equation uh, in one dimension. There's a huge amount of work on this, by the way. And uh, I don't know if I have too many parentheses here or not. X times 1 minus X times rho XX, which is often called uh, one of the Fisher equations. And it's, um, it, uh, then Fisher decided to add take Laplacian and add x times 1 minus x times rho to it. And then, as you know, then you have KPP, a version of KPP. Uh, Donald Fisher is a, a, some kind of genius, <clears throat> just like the Georgian, but a lot older, yes. And so the problem with this equation is, of course, that it has, um, it has singularities. Uh, they're just regular singular points, but still has singularities at 0 and 1. And of course, as a non-constant diffusion coefficient, of course, that, thanks to Lazzini, who, uh, if I'm lucky, is here, we know how to do that. But because it's degenerate, we don't know how to do that. And, and roughly speaking, you see, 0 and 1 are absorbing states. So I know you might, maybe you mind, uh, just to, for fun, we're spending some time on this. And, and so that the limit distribution is, um, is mostly, is entirely like at 0 and 1, which says, uh, and so it functions in this way, is uh, there's a gene change. After that, <clears throat> a given trial is lopsided. There's more big A than little a, or vice versa. And now, from then on, it, it works like a, a gambler's ruin problem. And, that, and so it either goes to 0 or 1. And in fact, this is correct. This is correct. Most of our genes are homos, and most of our genes were homozygotic. Did you know that? This agrees with, this agrees with biology, although the pro process is very, very slow. And of course, in some genes, we're not. Some very important genes, like cystic fibrosis, were not homozygotic necessarily. And it's the heterozygotes who uh, cause the problem. And, Okay, but we still have a lot of problems with that, um, but we're working on that. I'm just saying, I think that looking for gradient flows is very useful. So this is uh, basically my summary, uh, my summary slide. So uh, in, we, we discussed this grain boundary character distribution. Uh, it's a relative character distribution. So it's the amount of, um, the amount of boundary with a given lattice misorientation in normal. And there's consistency between experiment and simulation for this. There's also a lot of activity in the subject. And if the inter when the interfacial energy depends only on the lattice misorientation, then this GBCD is a Boltzmann distribution. And we used a mass transport based theory to describe the evolution of this GBCD, and we, we nailed it for uh, at least a simple case, okay? 
And the gradient flow identification is the first use of mass transport in this context. So we went from those pictures to gradient flow. And here is the gradient flow. I should have changed, I have a better picture here. And, uh, and the distribution. So this is what we did. And so then this brings to mind again, uh, here we are. And uh, this is, uh, of course, the castle, which I had to leave at a certain point in my life. And I'm uh, happy to, very, very happy and honored uh, to, to have returned. Thank you.